Um, welcome everybody to EOC's third Environmental Health Summit. Our summit is entitled COVID-19, Environmental and Occupational Health and Justice. My name is Kerry Margaret Butch, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Rutgers, Environment, Rutgers Center for Environmental Exposures and Disease. Today's session is making your New Jersey transit rides safer in the age of COVID. So now let's collectively recognize all who are part of making this series happen. And of course, we always single out Maria Crescenzio for her amazing technical assistance because we have to keep our t IT people happy. Um, anyway, <laughs> and she's been doing a great job for our entire series. So anyway, my pleasure, it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Buckley, Dr. Brian Buckley. He's the executive director of EOC, which is the Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences Institute. Um, he's also an adjunct professor of the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at Rutgers and the School of Public Health. So um, I can tell you that um, the focus of Brian Buckley's research is to bring environmental contaminant, contaminant measures meant to following, following disasters or in support of prevention programs to protect population at risk. He's also involved with the development of new technologies and training stakeholders to facilitate these measurements under difficult conditions. Um, I can tell you that um, when I first came to Rutgers, I had an office across the hall from Brian's and he is pretty much a hub. He is the man with the plan and he gets a lot done and he's interfacing with um, the director of our center, as well as tons of grad students and tons of researchers that are always looking to get research done. And he loves, I called him Inspector Gadget because he always knew the latest and greatest when it was coming to um, what, what was happening with, with measurements. And he, he, he could always explain it to me so that I could understand it. So I appreciated it. He, he, as he's been conducting work in, in, in Thailand Puerto Rico and New Jersey, as close as now Elizabeth and, and Newark, but he feels comfortable getting in a plane. I remember one of my favorite assignments with, um, with um, Brian is him saying, if we could get a plane, we could go to Puerto Rico. Get me a plane. So we got him a plane. But anyway, so it's always fun to work with him. I'm excited about this session. Enjoy this session. And I'm going to hand it over to Brian right now. Thank you. Carrie, thank you very much. That was a delightful introduction and <laughs> much appreciated. Uh, I'm going to start by thanking everybody, uh, both our panelists and our attendees for coming to today's session. Uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit about what I hope we're going to accomplish today. Um, this uh, presentation grew out of work that we're doing in conjunction with New Jersey Transit. Um, our third speaker today, our third panelist, is going to be Pat Zari. Pat is my counterpart over at Kate, the Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Technology. Um, New Jersey Transit reached out to Pat, and I'm going to let them tell us a little bit why later on. But I engaged Pat early on when we were building this disaster response initiative uh, that we have at Rutgers for responding to crises just like this one. We weren't anticipating, you know, we're, we're when, when, when we first organized this group, this disaster response group, we thought we'd be responding to things like hurricanes, and we have responded to Sandy, but we've also responded to chemical spills like Deepwater Horizon and such. But a, but a viral uh, pandemic is not, was not on our wheelhouse to begin with. So it was a new experience, but this notion that we can jump in, look at a problem, uh, identify the key uh, uh, things that we have to keep an eye on and then try and get some recommendations going forward is what this, the RU uh, disaster response initiative was designed for. And that's how we got involved here. So I'm going to uh, ask our, our two New Jersey panelists uh, to start with some questions to get the discussion started. Uh, Pat's going to present a, uh, a, a sort of a summary of our report to transit. Unfortunately, while we're recording this session right now, it won't be available immediately because a lot of the information that Pat is presenting is still in draft form for the report. And until the report's accepted, we can't talk about any sort of um, uh, uh, 
publication of the recording. But once it is, we can uh, potentially release it if you if you want to take a look later on. So this is one of those events. It's best to come to live. So for all of you, those who came live, you're you're getting a bonus. I'm going to absolutely try and leave seven to ten minutes at the end for Q and A. Uh, hopefully, you'll type your your chat questions into Kerry, and Kerry can read them at the end. I'd like to do the Q and A at the end, just because I think often that when a question comes up during a presentation, often it's answered later on, and and so hopefully we'll get to the things, and and those that don't, uh, we'll cover at the end. Deb McFadden is a representative from NJ WEC, and and had time permitted. We would have included her as a panelist, so I'm going to give her the opportunity if she's with us to ask the very first question at the end of the presentation. Um, I think that's about it. I'm going to do some introductions. Uh, we have two New Jersey transit representatives in the room right now as panelists, uh, John Dean and John Geithner. Uh, Chelsea Ramos, who was instrumental in putting this whole thing together from New Jersey transits and including asking or volunteering volunteering some folks to, to participate. Um, she's going to try and join us, but she's out in the field today, so she may actually be our roving reporter in a New Jersey transit vehicle if she's able to get to us at all. Um, but but John Dean and John Geithner, both New Jersey transit, I have had many, many meetings with these guys, all virtual, of course. We keep our social distances, um, but they were instrumental in in both shaping the scope of the project and 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 getting us to to focus on meeting New Jersey Transit's needs. Uh, I'm going to ask them each to talk a little bit about what they do at Transit after I introduce them. Fortunately, uh, John Dean has agreed to go by Jack. That's actually how he prefers <laughs> to be called, and I'm assuming he did that just so he would not be confused with John Geithner. But regardless, exactly. there, there will be there will be a Jack and a John today, and and Jack, I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, no one anticipates a crisis of this size, and and to trivialize this uh, by saying that this is just a, a, a flu or this, this just an event that we're going to get past clearly doesn't define what we're up against. And and I know that uh, uh, transit took this problem very very seriously, jumped on it right away. Um, I had no idea how big an issue it was until we started working with you folks. So, 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 Jack, can you tell us a little bit about, first of all, what you do at New Jersey Transit? I will give you Jack's title. Jack is, is the uh, Program Director for Research and Community Services for New Jersey Transit. Jack, hopefully you can tell us a little bit about what that means and what you do, but also, how big a project is this? You know, what's the ridership? How many buses? What What are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thanks, Brian, and thanks for inviting us in today. Really appreciate it. Um, my uh, my scope, if you will, within the planning department of New Jersey Transit includes research. So this type of research that we're talking about today, as well as market research, so outreach to the customers to find out what they're interested in and, and to other stakeholders to help you know, refine our services. Uh, community services is another branch within New Jersey Transit that really offers services and support to towns, counties, and nonprofits to operate their local transit. New Jersey Transit, of course, is a very large agency. We're the third largest agency in the country after New York and Chicago. Um, and we run, of course, everyone's familiar with big trains and big buses to big cities, but community services really helps out on that first mile, last mile, uh, helps job seekers, helps people with uh, disabilities, seniors, rural residents. And um, I can tell you a little bit more about, you know, the, the kernel of, of where we started the project, but just wanted to put that out there that New Jersey Transit is, is a very multidimensional transit agency. Just for a scale, uh, we cover a service area of about 5,300 square miles. So nearly all towns within the state. We do that with a fleet of about 2,200 buses. Uh, some of them are the local transit buses that you see in a city like New Brunswick. Others are the cruiser buses that ride uh, long distances into New York City. We have also uh, 1,200 passenger rail cars and uh, over 90 light rail cars. And that's uh, operated with a total staff of over 11,000 people. So we're a very large organization serving a lot of people, uh, over 900,000 uh, trips per day. 
before COVID. Um, and, uh, you know, very important services that are important both to, you know, white collar, high uh, income people going into the cities and people who have few transportation options and really depend on our services to, to just meet their daily requirements. Uh, when the pandemic exploded in New Jersey um, early on, it really had a, a very important impact both on our uh, customers as well as our staff. And we can go into further detail about that later. Great. Um, thank you very much. I, I had no idea until we started working with Transit how big a situation it was when they started talking about 3,700 vehicles. I said, oh my gosh. You know, this is, and that's just the buses. That doesn't include the trains. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a lot going on. My understanding is Chelsea has joined us uh, uh, from the road. Chelsea, thank you for joining us. Chelsea is a technical specialist for the environment, energy, and sustainability uh, at New Jersey Transit. She's the one who organized the transit folks, and she is a panelist. So when, when John or Jack forget something, Chelsea is there to pick them up and, and, and answer the questions as well. Um, so, uh, Jack, that was a that was a great introduction as to how uh, how big a project this turned out to be, and and John, I'm going to ask you at this point in time after you after you tell us a little bit about what you do. John is um, is the senior director of environment, energy, and sustainability. I remember being one when senior was not such a good word, <laughs> but it clearly <laughs> is showing experience and all of that other good stuff. So in a title, it works pretty well. But uh, but but John's going to tell us a little bit about what he does. What I'm hoping he will address today, though, is what happened at Transit. When did you realize that this was a really serious crisis? And and when did you realize you needed to 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 look at technologies that were not presently part of of your situation? Brian, thank you. Um, hope everyone can hear. Listen, I you know it's a great question. I do want to get to that. Um, first, I'll just let you know a little bit about who I am, what I do for transit. Um, so again, Brian mentioned the title um, environment, energy, and sustainability. So I lead a team here at Transit that's responsible for everything from environmental compliance. Um, to our energy and sustainability uh, programs. And under compliance, as you might imagine, it's everything from underground storage tanks to air emissions to historic preservation to the typical compliance activities you'd associate with an organization such as Transit and the kind of work that we do. So um, we have a great team. Um, Brian uh, mentioned Chelsea um, earlier, and Chelsea's a member of that team and, and does a great job for us as well. Listen, on the, on the energy sustainability side, it's an exciting side for us as well. We uh, manage transit's energy footprint. We do a lot of analysis on energy use. Uh, we do a lot of uh, prediction models on where we're going with energy. And on the sustainability side, you might imagine, um, listen, we do a lot of looking into ways that transit can, can have a smaller footprint, whether it's um, for emissions, whether it's for energy use, whether it's for waste generation, those kinds of things. So it's really it's an exciting group. It's a great group to be, um, to be a part of. And i um, very excited to be here today. So thank you very much. Listen, uh, Brian mentioned, you know, when did Trent become sort of fully engaged in, in the COVID um, awareness and response? And that's good. That's a great question. So Transit um, is lucky that it has, as part of its organization, um, its own police department. And that police department manages our emergency response um, sort of stature. And what they've done over the last couple of years, which has been a, a great move on their part, is to bring Transit into the National Incident Management System Protocol. Uh, NIMS. And one of the outcomes of the, the, the NIMS protocol is what they call the Incident Command System, uh, ICS. And really, Transit approached the, the response to COVID under the Incident Command System. So we established an Incident Commander. We established uh, various operating groups or various groups under the Incident Command. Um, they included operations, logistics, uh, finance, planning, those are the kind of groups that, that got together, so just so people understand the structure. So under the incident command system, there's an incident commander, and then there are, are um, heads of each of those different groups under that incident command. I serve as the, uh, the head of the operations group, um, and I also uh, toggle back and forth as incident commander as needed. In fact, today is a good example. Um, today, I'm actually the incident commander. Tomorrow, I will not be. So it actually does vary day to day. Um, and we keep a very tight structure to make sure that people know um, who to contact should an incident arise. So way back in, I would say early February, we began to establish 
the roles and the teams under the NIMS incident command system framework. Um, and it was important that we did that because there were a lot of questions coming to us as, listen, I think back in those days, we probably all can agree that the information coming out was pretty disjointed. Um, there was no clear understanding of exactly what we were facing. So it was important to get ourselves a structure established so that we could start to, to really hit into some of the questions that were coming our way. Hey, some of those questions were things like, um, is it safe to ride the system? Or, you know, how do people get the, the you know, how do people become infected with COVID? Listen, some of those questions clearly were not questions directly for a transit agency, but the first one certainly was, is it safe to ride the system? So our, our immediate focus began in the early days to look at what constitutes a safe to ride system. And we looked at that specifically from our, our disinfection and cleaning protocols. You know, how, how often do we clean our revenue vehicles? And when I say revenue vehicles, I'm talking about the buses and the train cars that the public would ride. So let's specifically look at revenue vehicles. So listen, we had processes and procedures in place already for cleaning and disinfection. Um, but we recognize that unless we were doing it daily, those processes and procedures may not be what's needed to combat what began to look more and more as we worked our way through February as a battle on the cleaning and disinfection front to make sure that our vehicles were, were sanitized. And as much as we understood about COVID at the time, we did recognize that, that, that surfaces and air, keeping those things as clean and sanitized as possible, seem to have the best effect against ensuring that um, COVID wouldn't spread. And I say that um, the way I said it, because again, we were still understanding how COVID was spreading. So we jumped in early on to take a look at our procedures, the chemicals that we use, the, the frequency that we did it. And Brian, we adopted a system where we began a daily cleaning and sanitizing of our revenue vehicles. And that includes um, both spray fogging and, and wiping down the types of disinfection that were, were judged, I think, since to be effective against um, sort of slowing the spread of COVID-19. And we've maintained those protocols ever since that time. So again, early February, we began to set up the incident command system with an incident commander um, and then people in the roles. And then through the month of February into March, that group was responsible for beginning to formulate some policies and procedures and changes to existing policies and procedures to sort of stem the tide of what we understood COVID-19 to be at the time. If that understanding has evolved since then, we still do our, our, our cleaning and sanitizing on a daily basis. We've stepped up our efforts um, as well in some of the, the um, facilities that, that customers would use. We recently opened our ticket offices, things like that, doing that. And we're always um, looking to see how can we do it better? Uh, as you might imagine, it's fairly time consuming to do that kind of work on the number of vehicles that Jack mentioned. Um, so, you know, one reason, and we'll talk more about this throughout the program this morning is we wanted to engage a partner like Rutgers to help us understand what other technologies existed, what other ways should we approach it. Um, and I think that was one good outcome of the incident command system is it allowed us the flexibility to reach out to other thought partners here to work ourselves into a, um, a better place to be. But I know that was kind of long-winded, but I hope, I hope Ryan, that was um, ultimately the essence of what you were asking. That, that was great, uh, John. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I went to training uh, on, on the incident command system um, about a year and a half ago because someone at some point in time decided that all of these academics walking around trying to collect time critical samples during some sort of crisis, they might want to know how not to uh, trip over their own feet, get, get in the way of the, the disaster responders and things like that. Fascinating. I was not aware until just now that, that this went to incident command and, and that's 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 outstanding in terms of response element. Now you you, you gave me a good lead in for the next uh, uh, the next question or the next uh, uh, topic that we want to cover, which is um, uh, why Rutgers and Jack. I'll, I'll put that to you. Um, you know, clearly you guys had a uh, had a, an overall objective, but uh, but why partner with Rutgers? Sure, uh, happy to talk about that. So as we started to work up the notion of whether um, ultraviolet disinfection could be a useful strategy, um, especially towards you know, what John had mentioned, the trade-off between the, uh, the staff hours required to do chemical disinfection. Um, we were also looking at it initially with respect to the community transportation partners, so the towns, the counties who use minibuses, um, as well as our, our own access link uh, paratransit system, who use minibuses to carry particularly seniors and people with disabilities. Um, could ultraviolet 
um, provide uh, a greater level of disinfection, especially for customers who may be the most medically fragile. Um, so that was sort of the, the, the kernel of it all. Uh, we had an existing, we have, we enjoy, a uh, task order relationship with Kate. Um, and so it made a lot of sense both to tap into the knowledge of Rutgers, the breadth and depth of uh, the research capabilities, but also the applied capabilities. You know, how does this actually work in the field uh, versus on the laboratory bench? Uh, so having the access to Rutgers through the task order relationship allowed us to really jump right in without uh, all the procurement rigmarole and to, you know, access a uh, nationally, you know, recognized university's resources. Thank you. That, Jack, that was a great response. And, and to remind people who may not know what, what Kate is, that's where uh, Pat is from, Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Technology. And, and Pat will get an opportunity to talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Um, having that existing protocol or that the standing order with Kate made the whole process so much faster. And, and I, I will pat everybody on the back a little bit, myself included, for us to pull this off in, in, in under two months, which is what we did from executed order until the first draft of the report, is, is remarkable from a research perspective. And, and I know that everybody wanted to jump into every uh, commercial uh, device out there and, and utilize it right away. And I, I think New Jersey Transit saying, if we get this done real quick, we can actually evaluate which technologies are the most effective for what we're looking for. I think that that was, was a great choice on transit's part. And, but, but the fact that we got this whole thing accomplished in under two months, I think is, is probably a world record from, from a research <laughs> perspective. And especially from an academic perspective who usually can't decide which committees to form within two months. So, so uh, it, it did work well for everybody. My next question goes to John. John, what were you hoping to get out of this project overall? So, so what were you looking for specifically as the end product in terms of both what you put forth to Rutgers and, and what was delivered in the final report? Thanks, Brian. Um, and listen, that that um, this answer is going to evolve a little bit because the question evolved in my mind what we were specifically looking for when we first got involved with, with Rutgers. Um, I think one thing that did um, become apparent when we got involved with Rutgers was the, the depth and the breadth of, of what they could provide to us. So initially, Brian, I was kind of looking to find out more about ultraviolet disinfection technology. Um, and it was somewhat limited. And listen, that's part of an outgrowth of, we mentioned the, the instant command system where you, you, you try to find, you try to limit your questions to find answers to those questions as you begin to expand out. So I didn't want to approach things from, I want to find everything out. I kind of wanted to find out about UV technology. One of the reasons why that was important to us was because, as you might imagine, we're part of the country where there are numerous large transportation systems. Uh, Brian mentioned the MTA. Um, certainly, um, the MTA is, is a very, very large system. Long Island Railroad, Metro North, New York City Subway, uh, New York City Bus. We were um, close to Philadelphia's SEPTA, SEPTA system. So, as you might imagine, transportation agencies talk to each other. And luckily, during COVID, we had that open communication between our sister agencies as well. In fact, our CEO is a member of what they call the Seven States Commission. And that's um, transit agencies across seven different states in the Northeast that are talking on a, on a weekly basis. So we noticed that there was a lot of interest among our partners in, in UV technology. And we knew it wasn't something new, but we noticed that the interest regarding COVID was, was relatively new. And specifically, our partner um, right across the Hudson, the MTA, was looking to do a pilot program on, on using UV technology. So we understood that that it was important for us also to get a handle on, on what UV could bring to, to our cleaning and disinfection protocols. So, Brian, that was my initial question, is really what, what was the, the usefulness um, of UV light regarding COVID? Um, was there a way that we could show it being, um, having a certain efficacy, having a certain ability to, to destroy the virus? And then was it usable in our operating circumstances, which, are kind of unique, right? So as, as Jack mentioned, as, as Brian reinforced, we have a lot of buses. And those buses come back to a, to a bus barn, a bus garage somewhere. Um, and even if it's, whether it's on the, the, the commuter side or whether it's on the paratransit side, 
technical programs, we, we have a lot of vehicles out there. So was UP Light really going to be an effective way to sanitize a large group of vehicles each and every day? And what would the time frames required? What, what would be the time frames required to do that? Listen, that was my initial question. But once we got into the the, the look at UP, Rutgers, to their credit, brought up some other technologies that that were also interesting. What what about advanced filtration? What did that really bring to the table? Was that something that we should be looking at? Um, what about ionized air systems? Were they also something that could um, augment, supplement, or take the place of UV if UV was judged not to, to be usable for us. You know, it evolved a little bit. Um, initially, it was UV, but then it evolved into some other technologies that um, that aren't that, that were and still are out there. Take a look whether or not they'd be usable. Listen, I want to keep on bringing this down for the group. It's important to understand is, um, you know, Brian mentioned this early on. He was surprised at, at just the size of the system. Um, any system, any kind of a, a cleaning and disinfection technology that we were going to employ had to work for the system. It had to be, it had to be durable, usable, had to be able to be deployed and used on a, on a, on a frequent basis. Obviously, chemical uh, sanitizing, spraying, and wiping, pretty obvious that, that, um, that that's doable on a large system, although it is manpower intensive, as Jack mentioned. So I was very impressed with Rutgers in that they were willing to get into the weeds of our system. In other words, how do you how do you deploy a UV light fixture on a on a bus? How do you make sure it works within the constraints of of time and space and the necessity of doing a daily disinfection and cleaning? One good thing that um, kind of developed as you work closely with Rutgers is Rutgers' willingness actually even to go to our garages, climb on board our buses, to do measurements, and to do all the things that were necessary to determine if UV light was going to work or not. Um, it, UV light was the initial con, the initial focus, the initial interest, but it did branch out happily into other areas as well. Thanks, John. Um, I there are some other questions that I would love to to cover, but we're not going to be able to get to it from time. But what I will do is is post them potentially as FAQs, and and perhaps we can get some written responses on our sites for things like mm -hmm. why was it important. Chelsea, I want to give you the opportunity. These guys forget anything. I, you're, you're actually in a New Jersey transit vehicle, which I just think is great right now. Did, did they miss anything? A no, clean sanitized one. That's right. Yeah, we are also hitting a lot of our fleet vehicles, so we didn't forget about those. Um, no, I think I just want to say our partnership with um, Rutgers was definitely rewarding, I think, on all ends. So we're very happy that we had this partnership with you guys. and. Um, to really be able to go down and gritty, down and dirty in the in the science of it is what really kind of um, gave us a leg up on a lot of the information that's out there. Um, obviously, we were bombarded with a lot of claims and information and new technology that no one really knows about. Um, so I think definitely having you guys as a partner definitely helped us a lot in kind of guiding us on what we should look at, what we shouldn't look at, and what do we think is the best um, technology that we can implement on our vehicles to help our customers and our passengers. So um, we're very um, happy that we have this partnership with you guys. Good. I, I think I think the partnership worked really, really well. I, I, I feel very lucky because I'm actually at a place where people pay you to continue to learn stuff. And <laughs> and Pat and I had certainly had some some background information and was learning about COVID as we go. But because of this project, I delved much deeper into disinfection technologies than I would have otherwise. So, so we were very, very fortunate. Um, I want to give Pat enough time, though, to tell tell everybody, tell our audience what we found and what we recommended. And Pat's going to cover the report. Um, and 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 go ahead, Pat. Uh, I, I already introduced you as the associate director for the Center for Advanced Infrastructure and Technology. I know him because I shared a, a title review committee position with him many, many years ago, but I also know him because he has kind of a similar role over at Kate that I have at EUHSI. So Pat, tell tell everybody what we what we decided or what we found as far as technologies and, and what our recommendations were. Sure. So uh, I'll give a quick overview of the project, but first, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say that this was clearly a very, very fast moving rapid response project. Uh, the bulk of the work was done in about 5 weeks of time. Uh, we're probably, you know, went a little bit over to, to dig into some of the details a little bit more. And, you know, in the research community to do something in about 5 weeks 
and to start giving results within you know within a week you know here, here's answers to the, some of the immediate questions what should we be doing what should we be looking at what are other agencies doing and i mean i think just as a as a person living uh in, in this pandemic you you appreciate that you know information is changing what we heard back in february february is is much different than than some of the information that we're hearing today so uh, so this was a, a super challenging project. I think with any project, you start with a, uh, an idea of, of you know, hey, this is going to work. You know, I think Jack uh, or John, John had mentioned, you know, we're real interested in UV technologies. We know that they've been used in hospitals. They've been used. Uh, other agencies were looking at it. So I think we kind of went into this with a very positive outlook and uh, really learned a lot uh, along the way about what would work, what wouldn't work. And, uh, you know, hospital setting uh, with limited operating rooms and things like that is incredibly different than, uh, than a setting such as a, uh, a transit bus that, that, you know, with seats and shadowing and things like that. So for first, uh, just kind of the legal stuff, it, you know, we haven't finished the report yet, it's still under review with New Jersey Transit. Uh, they assume no liability for the contents of this uh, this this presentation. They've ha had a chance to review this presentation. We're not done with the report, um, and we really just try to provide as much detail and information to New Jersey Transit along the way. We don't try to do an apples to apples comparison, uh, and that, that makes it difficult because we knew that we wouldn't be able to be uh, we wouldn't be able to do live virus testing. So we had to come up with a testing plan that worked for a very quick duration that got us answers to I mean, not all the questions but representative questions that decisions could be made uh, so it'd be data-driven decisions um, so you know so what would what you know let's define the problem you know we, we know the, the pandemic uh you know you know we want to better disinfect the buses we want to restore rider confidence uh there was a survey done in early april that showed you know, well over 50% of the riders uh, were, were not comfortable uh, riding the buses and, and didn't plan to return to riding the buses anytime soon. And, and there was also a lot of hype. We saw, uh, we saw videos uh, coming out of China where it would drive through devices where a, a bus would go and drive into a, a garage and the garage would just shine lights on it. And uh, it, we saw a lot of these new technologies, these new devices, just really coming out of the woodwork and uh and, and, and to transit's credit i think that they've you know done a good job at not just jumping into the fray and uh, believing what these vendors are claiming you know i, I don't want to say uh snake oil but it, it's it's clearly you gotta manage your expectations i think all these devices add value it's just a matter of how much value does it work in this environment? Does it work within the transit environment? Uh, so really kind of demystifying uh, some of these devices for transit. Um, so this presentation has really just got three parts today. We're gonna go pretty rapidly. Uh, there was a lot more information that we uh, uh, addressed, uh, but in a 20 minute presentation, we're not gonna be able to cover everything. Uh, so we're really gonna give a quick introduction to UV for the people that may not be familiar as familiar with how UV works and what some of the expectations are. And uh, then we're gonna get into our surface disinfection testing plan, as well as go over our, um, uh, go over our HVAC uh, options that we identified. Um, so uh, UV, just to kind of start with, UV is outside the visible spectrum. And this is really important because when you talk about a UV bulb, it, it's a light bulb. It, it's similar to a light bulb, but it's not emitting anything that you can see. Even even the ones that have uh, um, uh, where you can see some kind of bluish glow, that bluish glow is not UV light. UV light is absolutely invisible, and uh, and and you can't see. And that's something important to really distinguish right from the get go. And really, there's there's a, a wide range of wavelengths, you know, from the 100 to 400 nanometer wavelengths uh, with a very specific wavelength, the 200 to 280 wavelength, that is what we really refer to uh, as, as the germicidal wavelength. Uh, so it can kill, kill viruses and bacteria that breaks down the DNA and inactivates the, 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 the viruses. 
Uh, the sunlight that you generally see is more that UVA, UVB. When you buy sunblock, usually it talks about UVA, UVB rays. It's not talking about UVC. UVC is really not something that we experience from the sun. This is something that's really from the, the germicidal light bulbs that you would use in, in much more of that clinical hospital setting traditionally. Um, 254 is, is a number that we see commonly cited. It's uh, not necessarily the optimum wavelength, but it is, it is the most commonly cited number because it's what's generated from mercury. Uh, if you remember way back to high school physics, you know, different, uh, um, uh, different elements emit different wavelengths of light and redshift and sunlight and all that good stuff. But mercury is really producing a peak in this 254, which is pretty darn close to, to an optimum germicidal wavelength. Uh, so we see that reference a lot in the literature. Um, and it is, it is well established in the healthcare settings. Uh, if you go into a hospital, you'll even see, you know, banners that we use XYZ UV device to disinfect. And there's a lot of benefits of using uh, uh, UV. It, it disinfects without the use of chemicals, without the use of, of residues. Um, but there are some drawbacks. Uh, there are some health risks. Uh, it is definitely not something you want to look at. Uh, if you look at a UVC light with your eyes, you, you absolutely can damage, permanently damage your, your uh, corneas. Uh, it can absolutely burn your skin within, within under a minute. Uh, it, it's depending on how close you are. The closer you are to the light source, the more intensity you're going to absorb. Uh, but generally, you wouldn't want to be exposed to a UV light uh, for, for more than a minute working in any kind of reasonable proximity. There's also a, uh, some UV bulbs uh, do produce ozone. Um, and there's really nothing magical about a UV bulb. A UV bulb is very similar to uh, your standard fluorescent bulbs that you see in, in your workshops and things like that. And just like those light bulbs, they, they contain mercury. Remember uh, the CFLs, if you broke a CFL, you had to you know, sweep up the debris and throw it in the garbage. It, it's the same thing, it contains mercury. So the bulbs themselves contain mercury. They can produce ozone unless they have a coating and they can and absolutely will damage your eyes and skin if you look at it. So there are some certain safety precautions you'd wanna take when, when working with these kinds of bulbs. Uh, specifically, if you're using it for disinfection, you wouldn't want to use it when people are around. Uh, so we're really talking about unoccupied buses. Um, oh, and, and there is a, one more uh, factor is uh, just like uh, UVA and UVB, it will degrade plastics over time. Uh, if you've ever had a uh, plastic lawn furniture or something like that, that uh, you leave out in the sun for a few years, it, it gets brittle and, and breaks. The same can happen with UVC. So uh, we don't expect any structural damage to uh, the interior of a, of a bus, but it's just something to, to take note of that it can cause uh, bleaching and some material degradation. Um, so, so the basics of UV, um, it, it, it's like your headlights in your car. Uh, the further something is from, uh, from your headlight, the harder it is to see, the, basically the less intense it is. So if you have a, a bulb, a UV bulb, and it's within, let's say, two feet of you, and it's producing uh, an energy level, of, let's say, 1,000 milliwatts. You know, let's keep the number simple, like 1,000 milliwatts at two feet. When you move eight feet away, it goes from 1,000 milliwatts down to 60 milliwatts. Uh, so, you know, you sit there and say, well, well that's, a, that's a huge drop just based on a few feet. And within a bus, two feet, eight feet, these are relative distances. We're not talking about, you know, uh, 30, 40 feet away. We're talking about within, you know, like a, a standard um, uh, New Jersey Transit bus is around 40 feet long. So you can imagine how quickly the intensity drops. It drops with the, the inverse square of the distance. And, and that thousand drops down to, you know, 60 reference. It's just kind of a nice uh, quick idea of how quickly it drops down. The other important thing to remember with UV light, like I said, it's not magical. You can't see it. it it's something you can see with, your, with the, the, the naked eye, but it works just like regular light. So it works by line of sight. So if there's a back of a chair, uh, it, the light's not going to penetrate through the back of that chair. 
if there's a shadowed with a regular flashlight, it's going to be that same kind of shadowing effect that's going to occur with, with UV light. Uh, the other important thing with UV light is it gets absorbed by a lot of things, humidity in the air, uh, the air itself, and, and including clear glass, uh, sunlight, uh, a flashlight, those pass through clear, uh, clear surfaces, polycarbonate shields, uh, wind shields, uh, but UV light generally does not pass through glass and generally doesn't pass through um, any kind of interior uh, uh, barriers. Um, and you might sit there and say, oh, well, isn't it, you just told me it's a light bulb. So how does it, how does it go and, and pass through the, the glass on the light bulb? And the reason why is because it's a special kind of glass. Uh, it's, a, it's like a quartz glass as opposed to, um, you know, your standard regular glass. Um, but really they're very common, you know, very similar to other types of, of bulbs that you have and things that you would think about are, are very similar. Uh, so one of the things we did is we looked at all the different devices out there, and there's a ton of them. And I mean, everything from little handheld devices to really elaborate devices and, you know, ranging in price from a few thousand dollars to uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, something small, like 10 pound device versus something that's 200 pounds. And when we were looking at the transit environment, this was important because um, if you got to carry something onto a bus and you have to place it and you need to get it off of the bus, the time to move something, the time to place it, the time to hang it. Uh, and we're talking, you know, Jack and John were talking about the size of the fleet early on uh, with 35, 3,600 vehicles, not even including the, the train cars uh, and late rail cars. We're talking about thousands and thousands of vehicles. So how do you go in and come up with a plan that allows you to bring all these devices on to properly position them uh, in order to get the best light coverage and then remove them uh, after they've done their job? So what we did is we, we took two, uh, two representative devices. One was a real small, uh, the one on the left here, it's a small portable device, weighs about 10 pounds, uses standard Philips uh, UVC bulbs. Uh, and could easily be hung from the grab rails that you'd find in, in most buses and rail cars. Uh, and then we also used another device uh, that uses a, a different technology, uses pulse xenon technology as opposed to mercury. Uh, similar premise, uh, in this case though, it, it, it flashes. And one of the reasons why we wanted to look at this one was because our, our neighbors to the north, uh, MTA out of New York, was piloting this. Uh, so we really looked at a mercury uh, device and a pulse xenon device, and we came up with a, a testing plan. Once again, we weren't going to test this against a live virus, so we wanted to make sure we can come up with something that provided some, some information. So we went to the New Jersey Transit garages and we used a, a LIDAR device, a laser scanning device, to basically map the uh, interior of, of a bus. And you see here on the right, this is a digital, almost like a, a video game, a 3D rendered environment using this laser scanning device that collects millions of, of data points so we could really map the interior of the bus. And once again, we're talking about the shadowing effect of the lights. Really, we wanted to go and create this virtual model so that in, you know, we can't see UV light. So how do we figure out what is shadowed and what isn't if we can't see it? So we went back to the, uh, uh, the, the office with all this data after scanning the buses, and we modeled all different locations where you could put uh, the, the UV lights and try to determine what would receive shading and what wouldn't receive shading. And uh, for, for the purposes of this model, we ignored reflections. Um, you know, we weren't really sure how much UV light would reflect. We know it gets absorbed by, by things like glass and air and humidity. So we said, well, let's just focus on the direct line of sight. Where could we position lights uh, within the bus so that we can determine what gets shadowed and what doesn't? Once again, we can't see the light. So we had to figure out a way to do this. So we ran the models and, you know, jumping way ahead, there's lots of math and simulations and things like that to come up with. Uh, near optimum locations, we ran the models, but we also talked to transit about, well, you know, how, how long is reasonable 
to go and, and carry these devices onto the bus? How long is reasonable to set these up? How many devices? Um, you know, obviously, if you had 20 devices on a bus, you might use very small devices that get a much more evenly distributed light. But how long is it going to take you to set up 20 devices? Uh, if you use, let's say, one or two really, really big devices, it's going to be quicker in your setup time, but you're not going to get as even as a, uh, a light distribution. So it wasn't just a matter of the models. It was also in, in discussions about what is practical to, to, to set up and, and use. And in doing that, you know, we really came up with a lot of different, uh, different questions about really what made sense. So on, on the right here, we have uh, you know, your 40 foot urban transport bus, which is a very open floor plan. There's that, that uh, handicap seating uh, in the front. It's very open. Uh, people getting on and off rapidly. Uh, the one on the left is your, your paratransit bus. Uh, and then what we did is we just wanted to show the seats. And if you look at this, you'll see the areas in yellow were areas that would receive the light and the areas in, uh, in, in blue uh, receive shadowing. We said, well, geez, this is, this is alarming because clearly there's some high touch surfaces, uh, the seats themselves, some of the hand grabs um, that aren't getting the UV light directly. Doesn't mean they won't get disinfected based on reflections and things like that, but we knew that based on just that direct line of sight, they wouldn't be getting uh, a, a dosage. And when you think about a reflection, now you've increased the distance that the light would have to travel. So we knew that you know, any, you know, relying on reflections would result in a, a lower intensity. So what we did from there is we said, okay, well, this is a good starting point. We know if we can get a good coverage within the bus using three or four different devices. And that seemed pretty reasonable to go and, and, and carry these on onto and off of the bus. And uh, so then we went and we actually worked with transit to, to get access to some of their buses. And, and John mentioned it. We had no problem crawling all over these buses and positioning lights and, and uh, really taking a lot of field measurements and data, not only in the laser scanning, but also in, in deploying uh, UV lights. Uh, so we used a spectrometer uh, to go and collect real <coughs> measurements. So it was no longer just relying on that line of sight and uh, you know, we were able to really measure what, what was happening. And, and we were looking at, the, uh, uh, looking at the different locations, looking at what, what made sense. I'm sorry, let me go back one. Um, and so we were able to account for all that and summarize it. And even there, we, we found that there were some locations that just simply didn't get light. There's a lot of plastic barriers in, in the bus. There's a lot of seats and seat backs. Uh, and there were some areas that just couldn't, wouldn't receive any kind of disinfection. And that was kind of concerning for us, uh, that there would be some areas that, that wouldn't get it. Uh, so when we looked at it, then we started looking at some of the, uh, some of the logistical concerns too of, well, is this going to save time and money, right? You know, if, 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 if it takes longer to do this and, uh, and it's not necessarily giving you a better result, then does it make sense? So then we, we, we actually went through and we said, well, let's do a, a time test. Let's go and carry everything onto a bus, run through the timing and see how long this really takes. You can imagine if you're gonna go and do a spray disinfection where you take your, your chemical spray and you spray and you wipe and this and that, there's a no set of time, but how long does it take to carry these light bulbs? Remember, these are light bulbs. You can't just carry three or four of them in your arms and bounce through the bus. You're going to carry one at a time. You're going to run the extension cords, and then you're going to have the time that they're actually going to have to run. And when we did that testing, just to set up and take down for the devices was about eight to 12 minutes. Uh, so we said, geez, you know, it's going to take us some time to set these things up. It's going to take us time to run these devices with the disinfection time. And there's going to be some areas like underneath the seats that no matter what we do, unless we go and put a ton of these devices on there that are never going to receive light. And we haven't even gotten to the hard buses yet, like the, the really tightly packed, uh, um, uh, I shouldn't say tightly packed, but the, the tighter packed um, uh, uh, longer haul commuter buses. So. Uh, so we look at all these different things and uh, definitely had some concerns. You know, we went from, wow, this is great. It works in the healthcare industry to, 
geez, this might not work in a transit environment. Uh, so then we started looking at some of the other devices. We looked at the, uh, the Pulse Xenon device as well. And, uh, you know, we got, you know, even though our, our friends to the north of us were, were looking at doing some pilots, but we were concerned that uh, we weren't sure that we were getting the kill dosages with that. I think the traditional mercury bulbs are just that. They're traditional. They're more established. There's a lot more research and literature out there on them. The pulse xenon lights uh, don't really have that really nice uh, peak in that 254 nanometer wavelength that we expect to see that germicidal. Uh, so we were, we've got some inconclusive results there. So where does this leave us? So we ran through a bunch of numbers. I'm going to go quicker here because I know we have. Yeah, we're kind of out of time, Pat. So try and wrap up if you can. What I'll do is I'll just stop after, you know, uh, I'll just quickly go through. So we looked at is, you know, we went through and we said, you know, is it going to save us uh, labor? And the answer was no. Is it going to save us capital cost? And the answer was no. Is it going to save us ongoing maintenance costs? And it was, you know, roughly, roughly in the same ballpark. But we, we figured, you know, it's not going to save us time. We're going to hire more staff in order to handle all these devices. And then on top of that, where do we store all these devices? If you have to buy hundreds of these light bulbs, I don't want to say delicate because we all work with light bulbs, but they, they have to be handled properly. So if you have hundreds of these devices, where do you store all these in, in, in a garage environment? Uh, so ultimately, we said, geez, it probably doesn't save time save labor or necessarily do a better job you know you probably should kind of keep, keep going with your your epa list and chemical approved spray disinfectant you know maybe consider doing your weekly you know spray and wipe cleanings remove any residues and buildups and you know maybe in future generations if these were permanently mounted you know maybe this could cut down on your uh on your timing um but we really, you know, th this was the, 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 uh, uh, the findings out of the surface disinfection. We also looked at air uh, disinfection and some of those devices. We didn't have a chance to do uh, uh, field testing on that, but it was part of our findings of the study that this is, there's different things that we could do to do some evaluations, some demos, some pilots, and really help transit to, in the future, determine some, some efficacy uh, but there's a lot of uncertainty regarding those devices. So with five minutes, I, I think I should stop here and turn it back over to Brian. Okay. So, so I wanted some, some chances for Q&A. I think it's important to realize that the disinfection UV was compared against the chemical disinfection, which turned out to be faster. New Jersey Transit's been doing that from the get. The air uh, disinfection technologies, most of them are much newer technologies, unproven at this stage. So we will continue to offer uh, suggestions and, and what we found so far as part of our report. Carrie, what questions do we have? And I wanted to give Deb the first chance if she's on uh, to ask her question. Well, there is one question in the chat. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Were there any concerns that UV would degrade materials in the bus? And then I also want to um, encourage Deb to, to eat email uh get on or text me okay um were there any concerns that uv would degrade materials in the bus so i could probably jump on this one um and then i can turn it uh, i think transit was absolutely uh interested to know whether it would degrade so as far as a concern yes or was a concern uh and when we looked at it most of the existing literature we found really dealt with uh, UV degradation from sunlight, from UVA and UVB, and not UVC. Uh, UVC being much more limited to healthcare environment. Uh, so we found some studies that look at the degradation of common materials in healthcare. And it was, it was basically found that there could be some, some micro abrasions. Uh, maybe, you know, if you have the light bulb, if you have the bulb, really close to some uh, thinner material plastics, like a structural plastic, like a seat that's really thick, is unlikely to have any kind of significant damage. But you put that same uh, uh, unit close to like a vinyl material or, or some kind of thinner plastic wiring, yes, there absolutely can be some, uh, some material degradation. 
Um, Carrie, do we pick up any other questions? Because if not, I have the, I have a closing question that I will pose to the gang. I think Jeb is trying to get in. Let me see if I can get her via cell phone. Real quick. Okay. Yeah, I, I want to stress that the report includes recommendations on air filtration, air exchanges, and the devices that are available there. And those would be things that we would potentially impart while ridership is, is on the bus. Um, again, those technologies were a little newer and a little less proven than some of the UV where we had kill curves and such that we could uh, 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 measure some stuff with. So, Carrie, you're, 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 we can hear you. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I just want, I, I just want to say the report. Pat was going to get to that, just just didn't have enough time. So, um, uh, when the report comes out, you'll all be able to see what our re recommendations were. We think that that clearly there needs to be more work done in the area of of air disinfection. Carrie, did you get the question? Yeah, Deb, can you go ahead and ask that question? Yes. Go ahead. I wanted to tell us some events that wasn't uh consistent. Well, I just want to say, you know, thank you for uh for thank you for this presentation. I know I certainly um learned a lot about uh what it needs to be like for disinfecting um and look forward to uh being able to read the report when it comes out. Um this question is really uh a story during the transit. Um well, the link that has come out between air quality and COVID, um, I was wondering if New Jersey Transit could talk a little bit um, about their electrification strategy. I know there's going to be a pilot trend, and I wonder if they could talk a little bit about you know additional electrification projects that are coming down from the, the pipeline. Can New Jersey Transit talk about their electrification strategy? Um, you know, I can, I guess it's a little bit off topic from, from this. So Brian, I don't want to stray too far. Right. Um, right. But if the question was about, um, electrification of the bus fleet, for example, um, New Jersey transit does have a, a limited deployment plan for the Camden area. That uh, product is already underway. Uh, it involves both uh, modifications to the bus facility as well as the purchase of electric buses. And again, um, what New Jersey Transit has done is taken a look at certain ridership lines where it makes sense based on the current capabilities of electric buses to begin an implementation strategy that way. So we're fully aware of the public's interest in electric, electric buses. Uh, we take that interest seriously. We've initiated some projects to um, address that. In addition, our, our five-year capital plan also talks about the upgrading of bus facilities, which is an essential part of bus electrification. We're talking about a you know, paradigm shift of fuel type here. So it takes a lot of work both to modify the facilities as opposed to just buying the buses. So we're looking at it holistically and we certainly do have um, the pilot product, the, I shouldn't call it a pilot, the limited deployment project in Camden, as well as some other modification products that are, are in the planning um, stages as well. John, thank you. Thank you so very much. And I appreciate you you stepping outside the, the topic a bit to, to answer that question. Um, it's 11 o'clock, so, so I've got to uh, pretty much call it a day. I, I thank my all of my uh, study participants. I, I will pose the, the remaining questions that I had and anything else we get to my uh, transit and, and Kate colleagues, and perhaps we can post some, some of those questions online uh, with, with some good responses. But thank you very much. I think we accomplished a lot in a very short period of time. And Carrie, thanks for setting all this up. I know you want to spend one minute and plug next week's. And I'll try to do a half a, a half a minute. Um, let's talk about um, our next session is on environmental COVID environmental justice and cumulative impacts. So um, let's talk about who's coming. Lou Lou Gould from Mount Sinai, Maria Lopez Nunez from the Ironbound Community Corporation, Nikki Schmitz. Um, and some, we're going to also have a couple more, but um, it's, it's really going to be talking about um, the discussion will explore how long term social and environmental inequality contributes to the de devastating impact of COVID-19 on the residents of low income neighborhoods and members of communities of color. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at and um, 
and discussing. So join us next week at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. Thank you all, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Yeah.